Bless his name. God is good and he provides for our, our needs, all of our needs. This morning we are starting a new series entitled Life in the Holy Spirit. It is the day of Pentecost. What happened nearly 2,000 years ago is still happening today. So when we talk about the Holy Spirit, who is the Holy Spirit, what's he like, how does he work in us, um, some people kind of think the Holy Spirit's a bit spooky. And I think the King James Version of the Bible, which is a beautiful translation, 1611, probably caused the problem by calling him the Holy Ghost. You know, like the, like the phantom, you know, the ghost who walks. And uh, the, like ghost, the connotations of spooky, um, or you know, mystical. And, and the Holy Spirit sometimes has been caricatured that when he's active and he's moving, he just pounces on people and gets them doing strange things. Nothing could be further from the truth. When we base our thoughts and our ideas on a very sound and complete reading of God's word. And so, you know what the Holy Spirit is like? In three words. Whether you hear anything else I say in this message, three. You know what the Holy Spirit is like? He is just like Jesus. Do you want to say it with me? He is just like Jesus. That's the deepest theology you're going to get in this place today. And I tell you, you can read a book of 500 pages on the doctrine of the Trinity, and they won't say it better than that. He is just like Jesus. So get away from all the mystical notions you might think regarding the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Um, and he has the same nature and the same character and the same will as Jesus, though he's a different person. And the same can be said about God, our Heavenly Father. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Same nature, same character, same will, though they're different persons. Three distinct persons. One God in Trinity. Not three gods. One God. God is the Father. God is the Son. God is the Holy Spirit. They're separate, yet there's one. Hey? Do you really understand this? Do you understand it? I've been scratching my head around that doctrine for 45, 46 years. I still don't understand it. It's not meant to be understood with your head. It's meant to capture your heart and evoke a sense of worship and wonder. It's a mystery. I don't understand it, but I accept it. I see it clearly in the scriptures. I submit to the revelation of what the Bible teaches about the Godhead. And I think the best illustration, well, some people get freaked out, and there's lots, lots of heresies about the Trinity. You can read church history. They try to, if you try and understand it with your mind, you'll go nuts. So some people go, one plus one, three distinct persons, plus one equals three. But the Bible says there's one. Ah, but God has a perfect mathematical equation to describe the Trinity. One times one times one equals one. So don't break your brains trying to understand it. When you read it in the scripture, just go, this is a mystery, this is a wonder, I worship, I accept it because I believe the scriptures to be the very word of God. Let Jesus speak for himself on this. And when you read the gospel of John, John chapter 14, 15, 16 really cover the doctrine of the Spirit from Jesus' perspective. So he gave some very clear statements. I want to read this one particularly. It's a beautiful one. John 14 says, If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another, I love the term, counsellor. He's a friend. He's a, he's a great psychologist. He's the best psychiatrist you can find. He is the best people helper because he's just like Jesus. He's the comforter or the helper, to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you, the 12 apostles and the 70 disciples. Hey, the Holy Spirit's with you and will be in you. That's a promise. And will be in you. 
He says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And some people at a superficial reading think that's the second coming of Christ. He's going to come again. No, 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 no. This is when Jesus comes to us through the giving of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. He breathed upon his disciples, says, receive the Spirit. Then he says to them, hang into Jerusalem and wait till I get to heaven after my ascension. And then I'm going to send the Spirit And so he's not referring to the second coming. And he's actually telling us that we are much better off if he goes to heaven and sends the Spirit. And you might say, oh, yeah, but Bill, if if Jesus walked in and came down that aisle and said, son, just move over, I'm taking over the preaching. I'm not going to argue with him, am I? But I know some of your response would be, wow, it's Jesus himself. Man, I can believe for anything. Why didn't I bring my sick dad and my, my, troubled, my troubled brother? And what about yeah, Uncle Fred who died? Let's go bring him, get him out of the morgue and bring him here. Jesus is here. He can do anything. That's a very religious notion that we have, that somehow our faith will kind of go whoomp like this if he physically turned up here. You know, the truth is, he is here with us, but not physically. He's with us through the Holy Spirit. And we are much better off because he can be here with us and he can be in Greece. He can be in all our Christian family centre churches. He can be at Bethel Centre, Papua New Guinea, where I was preaching last week at this time. And so he's not limited by space and time. And so now he can minister through the Spirit because the Spirit is just like Jesus. Wow, isn't that good? A brand new era commenced when Jesus went back to heaven from where he came, and he gave the Holy Spirit to us without measure. Wow, beautiful. Now, what does he do in our lives? There are three great works that he does. The first one is he converts us. The Holy Spirit leads us to Jesus. And I don't know where you're at here today. Whether you, some of you are not believers, I'm I'm sure in a crowd like this, that that you, you have a respect for God, otherwise you wouldn't be here. You, you have a, uh, an acknowledgement of Jesus, otherwise, why would you be here? If, if you're a Christ hater, you wouldn't be in church. So I'm assuming that you have a respect for Jesus and that you're here because the Holy Spirit is actually drawing you to help you to understand who Jesus is. He, you might be like the 12. He's with you, but he wants to be in you. Only he can convert a human heart. Only he can change us from the inside. Only he can reveal Jesus to us. And more than that, quicken our minds, enlightening our minds to understand, and then giving us the new life where Christ is reborn in our lives, in our hearts. See, Paul says, the Holy Spirit's in us. Then he says, Christ is in us. Hey, what is it? Can it be both? Because Christ and the Holy Spirit have the same nature. So he's talking about this new birth, this new life. He does the converting. I love this this verse in John 16. Let me read this to you. But I tell you the truth. This is Jesus again saying another lesson about the Spirit. It's for your good that I'm going away. I've mentioned that. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. Notice it says in sin because men do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness, because I'm going to the Father where you'll see me no longer. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. It's really interesting. We are not told to preach about sin. We are not commissioned to go around and say, now let's see how many sins I can find in my society, in individual people's lives, and then start pointing them out, and I'll make them feel guilty, and I'll bring conviction on them, and then I'll... and then to, to No, no, it doesn't work that way. Our commission, my commission, our commission individually as as believers is that we are to preach Jesus. We're to lift him up. We're to share with people both with our words and with our lifestyle who he is. And I tell you, then the Holy Spirit, he will do his work of conversion. He will convict of sin. He will point out people's sins. You may find a sin that's outward, but you do not know what's going on inwardly in a person's life. The Holy Spirit does. So he doesn't condemn. He convicts to bring us to a place where we acknowledge our need for a saviour, Jesus Christ. He's going to point out to say, hey, I'm going back to the Father so that you can have a right standing with God. So now you can have a right standing with God through my death on the cross 
and what I accomplished. And now through my resurrection, I'm going back. I'm sending the Spirit so that now when he comes into you, your sins will be cancelled out and you will have a right relationship with God the Father, not based on what you do, but on what I've done. And on judgment, he says, because the devil's been judged and condemned. So God doesn't want to judge the world. God doesn't want to condemn the world. The world's already condemned and judged. There is a real hell. There is a real hell. It's a physical place. It's a spiritual physical place. It can't be denied. And in fact, in many, in, in many respects, we see evidences of hell here in this world of ours. People who say there's no hell, look around and you will see people living in real hell. And God hates hell. He doesn't want to consign anyone to hell. His heart is that all people would come to a knowledge of his son, Jesus Christ, and be saved. But he can't force the issue. He can't make you a Christian. And so, so you have to believe upon him and, and deal with your independence. See, sin, I spell S-I-N, I is independence. I, I'm living independently of God. That's the worst sin. That's the biggest sin, that I ignore God, that I don't think he has a place in my life. But the great hole in your life can't be filled and that shape is in the shape of Jesus. And only he can save you and, and heal your soul. And so he wants to forgive us of all of our sins. He wants to give us peace in our hearts. He wants to give us the gift of eternal life. And the gift of the Spirit comes upon us. So salvation is, is, is the greatest miracle of the Holy Spirit. He loves to convert. If you're not a Christian here today, I pray that the Holy... And I have prayed this week that the Holy Spirit will lead you to Jesus to this morning, when I conclude and pray that you will open your heart and say, Jesus, be my Saviour and my Lord. Secondly, the Spirit, his task is to centre us. And he gives us Holy Spirit baptism to align us to the purposes of Jesus. Because we get so misaligned. And it left to my own devices and to my own resources, if I didn't have the Spirit of God within me, I know my own miserable heart my sinful heart, I'd deviate. I'd go, whoop. I'd be blinded of what the scripture says because, you know, the scripture is in black and white. The spirit has given us the word, the words of Jesus. But uh, the Holy Spirit helps us to see what the words of Jesus are, to really understand who Jesus is. And to, he testifies about Jesus. He reveals Jesus to us. So, so therefore, if I don't have the Spirit, I will veer off. If you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, you'll veer off. And so Holy Spirit baptism aligns us to the purposes of Jesus for our life, for our family, for our church. And have a look at John 14. He says, All this I have spoken while still with you, but the counsel of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've said to you. Interesting. Interesting. That's why we shouldn't ever deviate from reading the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. You need to read maybe a chapter every few days, at least once a week. Read a chapter or two of the Gospels and let Jesus speak to you through his words. It's a good habit to do it. Look at John 15. He says, when the counsellor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. So it's the Jesus of the New Testament Gospels that he testifies to. It's not a popular Jesus or a convenient Jesus, a Jesus of our own making who serves us. And folks, our culture and our society is racing into this anti-Christian, anti-Christ kind of mode where it was, oh, but Jesus' statements are old-fashioned now. We've got to catch up with where, with, with where society is at, where culture is at. And, uh, and so the Holy Spirit, his task is to remind us of all of Jesus' words. And some of those words are really inconvenient. Some of those words are incredibly challenging. But it's the Jesus of the New Testament whom we follow. And we have the revelation in the four Gospels and the Holy Spirit has come to live in us, to help us stay centred upon Jesus. You know, the, the 12 disciples, they got so misaligned very early in the piece. I mean, it's quite weird, but again, it's a salutary lesson. Jesus dies on the cross, he rises from the dead, he appears to them, they're not actually believing he's going to be risen from the dead, he says, well, touch me, feel me, and so he, they, they get convinced that actually it's all true. 
that he is the son of God, that his death on the cross is not a martyrdom, it's not, a, it's not an accident, it's a purpose, and now it all makes sense to them. Oh, he died for the sins of the world. He's not going to destroy the Roman Empire. He's actually creating his kingdom, his kingdom of love and peace among all nations. And, and so that they're starting to, to, to understand it, but they're still caught up in a very religious mindset. So, so then he's about to go to heaven, and so in Acts chapter 1, he's already given Matthew 28, the Great Commission, Luke 24, Mark 16, John 20, 21, four times the, the Gospels talk about the Great Commission being the marching orders of the church. But now he's saying to them, hey guys, the important task is to let the world know who I am and what I've accomplished for them. And I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to empower you to live the life that I'm asking you to live, but also to empower you to minister and to, to do mission. And so I'm, my presence is going to help you do the stuff. And uh, so you think they would have got it? You think? Now, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, four times it's recorded. Now, Acts chapter 1. We've got to read this. Have a look at this. This is classic. And it's still happening today. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave this command. He goes, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So he says, don't leave Jerusalem. Hang around there, guys. Remember, you've got to go into all the world and preach the gospel, share the good news with people, your world, where you live, and the physical world. And then they go and say, then they gathered around him and they said, oh Lord, yeah, 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 we get all that stuff, but, but you know, what about Israel? When are you going to restore Israel and knock the Romans on the head, the colonizers, and when are, you, when are you coming back? And I think Jesus would have kind of like shaken his head and gone, give me a break. Don't you guys get it? The Italians would say, oh, mamma mia, what are you up to? The Greeks would say, I won't say what that is. It's my trans. It's like, he says, guys. And, then, and so this passage next, he goes, he's almost a bit angry, a bit frustrated. He goes, guys, it's not for you to know. It's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. He goes, I don't know when I'm coming back. He goes, but guys, don't you get it? You've got to stay in Jerusalem for these few days. Get empowered by the Holy Spirit. You need this baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He realigns them from end times mania to world evangelization. And he says, you need the Holy Spirit to do that. How are we going to win our families to Christ, our friends, our workmates, our university, at school, our neighbours? You can't do it through your own self-efforts. You need the Holy Spirit. You need his baptism in the Spirit to empower you to go on and, 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 and to, to be able to share, to live the life and to have opportunities to, to speak to people. And I'll tell you, this is a, a potential problem with every generation where people get misaligned. I've just come back from Papua New Guinea and there's a new heresy that's come in that, that, that is all about Israel and the Sabbath. So they're now kind of like, right throughout Papua New Guinea, some, someone has come up and said, well, you know, the Old Testament law and New Testament grace fit together. And so we've got to follow all the laws. So we've got to start worshipping on a Saturday. And no one's told them that there's about 360 other laws that they've got to do, like putting parapets around their roofs and tassels on their clothes. There's a, there's a whole pile of stuff. If you're going to do that, man, you better, you're going to wear strange clothes, look different, and uh, you can't marry the old with the new. The new is a new testament. It's a new era. It, it fulfills everything in the old. I haven't got time to go into it. But one of the theories is, oh, yeah, yeah and God's just interested in Israel. So, so Jesus will come back when they build a temple again. I mean, what? What happens to the mosque of Omar? Oh, we blow that up and we put a, a, a Jewish temple. I mean, what Bible do they read? God doesn't like living in buildings. He doesn't like living in tents. His plan was always to live in your body. And the only way he could live in your body was if Jesus could come and deal with the sin issue that separated you from God. And now God looks at you and says, you're forgiven, you're cleansed. You can, I want to live in your body. I want you to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so it's kind of like, so I'm not, I don't want to be too hard on the first Christians. Every generation... People get misaligned and get diverted from the main game. Folks, we need the Holy Spirit. If you haven't received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, 
with the ability to be able to speak in a brand new heavenly language as the means by which you can keep being filled, you need to receive it. And in Acts chapter 2, he said to these boys, the, 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 the disciples, guys, you've got to stay there. Then you read Acts chapter 2, they received this wonderful gift and they started speaking in a brand new language, what they call the gift of speaking in other languages, in, in tongues. They didn't understand them. And it caused the conversion of 3,000 people. It was so amazing. And they prophesied, they spoke inspirationally. And, uh, and Jesus is saying, you guys need this gift. <laughs> That's why I pray in, in my heavenly language every day. I prayed when I got up this morning. In the shower, driving here, while Tanya was leading us in the worship. I mean, Tanya, I was just in the spirit. I'm just probably for 10 minutes praying in my prayer language, just quietly to myself, not loud so you could all hear. Personal, private, I'm just getting filled and refilled. I thought, God, I need your spirit to preach. I need your spirit to testify. I need your spirit to live my Christian life. If you haven't received the gift, hey, I've got this little booklet, Baptism in the Holy Spirit. Please take it. It's in the entranceway. And tonight I'm preaching also uh, uh, on the Holy Spirit and we're going to have a 30-minute time afterwards to pray for people to receive. You can come tonight and receive this experience. Grab the booklet, read it, do, take you about an hour to read it, read some scriptures, come prepared, come expecting and the Holy Spirit will come upon you. He who is with you will be in you. You know him through conversion. You can, if, if you're a Christian... You're no stranger to the Holy Spirit. He lives in you. But this is a baptism to empower you to be an effective witness and to empower your life to be able to live victoriously in Christ. So I encourage you on this one. We all need this baptism in the Holy Spirit to keep aligned. So I've just come back from Papua New Guinea and they're so misaligned. There's one group in Greece, in Athens, a Pentecostal group run by a heart surgeon. And it's a weird Pentecostal group. It's kind of, again, trying to marry law and grace. So the women sit separately. They've got to wear scarves. It's very anti-women. because They're taking scriptures out of context. And it's just weird. And it's like sinner hostile. That's what I call it. Sinner hostile. Why would you go there and be put down? And so, you know, like, I'm aware of this group. But there are other groups that are saying, hey, look. So, so some of the Greeks have gone into weird, legalistic, misaligned stuff. So I know my mission when I go there, I may even preach this message at the church, is that the Holy Spirit has come, we're Pentecostal, so that we can present Jesus Christ in all his beauty and glory and majesty and draw people to him. And we need the Holy Spirit. Why do I speak in tongues? Because tongues is the most important. No, it's the means by which I can continually be refilled with the Spirit, the engine of my life. I need grease in that engine to keep the jolly thing moving so it doesn't seize up. You need the Holy Spirit in you, through you, so you don't seize up and you can last a long distance, that the engine of your life will, will be around for, for decades to come. So if you haven't received this baptism in the Spirit, you need to. I'd love to pray with some of you this morning to say, hey, look, I'd like to, to receive this, this gift. Maybe not now, but on your own. I was on my own, 4 o'clock in the morning, received it as a, as a, in my late teens, it's never left. And tonight there'll be people receiving. You can come expecting. So the Holy Spirit has come to lead us to Christ, to convert us. He has come to center us through baptism in the Spirit so that we stay in line. And finally, He has come to conform us. To conform us like Jesus, so that we become like Him. Look at Galatians 4.19. My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth, childbirth until Christ is formed in you. So Paul is saying, you need the character of Jesus formed in you. And that takes time. Baptism in the Spirit and the gift of tongues is, is instant. It doesn't produce character formation. It's empowerment to witness and to minister. But, you, but the, the, the fruit of the Spirit, the life of the Spirit, takes time to produce. You can't just force fruit to grow. And so, um, so that's right. It says the nature of Jesus will gradually replace all the negative dimensions of your old life. And this happens when we cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Have a look at what Paul says to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 3. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Now these Corinthians were really messed up. They had a lot of dysfunction. You read about Greek society, ancient Greek society, and it was a mess morally, ethically. 
Okay, I love Greek history and the, the roots of our Western civilization come from the, these amazing Greeks. But morally, ethically, they were terribly corrupt. There was a lot of dysfunction in personal lives, in married life, in, in human behavior. Uh, women were treated like dirt. Kids had no rights. Uh, pedophilia was rife. And it was actually regarded as being noble. But the highest form of love was a man would take a little boy and be his mate. No one fully knows whether it was, it was totally sexual or whether it was just to impart, but it was weird. We think both. So if you see films like Troy and Alexander, you'll see uh, the great hero Achilles has his boyfriend, okay, who he grew up with. You have Alexander with Hephaestion having his boyfriend. They grew up together. So the, the connotations are that it's, it's, it's pedophilia, an adult with a child was quite normal. Weird. You imagine how messed up people were when they tried to get married and have kids and that. It was, it was catastrophic. So the Corinthian society was really corrupt, far, ten times worse than our society. At least we've got some Christian roots and foundations and, and basic rules, laws and ethics that operate. But there, it was weird. And so Paul is saying, guys, you can be changed. The old can drop off. Jesus can grow in you. This is the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5. But the fruit of the Spirit... The nature of Jesus is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You can't produce these qualities in you. Only the Holy Spirit can. So if you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, if you don't even receive baptism in the Spirit, you're going to be missing out on the empowerment that he gives to be able to change you. And uh, when I went to p and I, I, um, uh, I took about 100 copies of the Me I Can Be. They went in two days. If I had another 200, they would have gone on, on the Sunday. And one of the reasons why they're going so quickly is because the focus is the Holy Spirit can take the promises of God's word and actually produce the change and heal you of your dysfunctions. So my message in here is not baptism in the spirit for empowerment for witness, but more the spirit to change you. So his role is to conform you, to change you. And, and I would encourage you, if you have areas of dysfunction in your life or you need the Holy Spirit's help and, and to, to learn how and hear the testimonies of people, get hold of the book. They're, they're available there and read it and pray over it and say, God, deliver me as you delivered Penny and Kathy and, and Steve and Phil and, and Ray and, and all those testimonies, Jimmy, etc. So the precious and powerful Holy Spirit will take the promises of God's word about who you are in Christ and make them a reality in your life. Holy Spirit, the life in the Spirit. He has been given to lead you to Christ, to convert you. He has been given through baptism in the Spirit to help center you around the purposes of Christ. He has been given to help conform you to become more and more like Jesus. I want to pray for you. For some of you here, God is speaking about your need for the fullness of the Spirit and to be renewed in the spirit because without him you cannot live the Christian life you cannot function effectively I certainly couldn't let's stand together as we pray